This lightly written and frequently amusing book gently hides the competent scholarship that underlies it. For those who are convinced of the superiority of the KJV, whether for stylistic, cultural, pedagogical, theological, or traditional reasons, this is the book to read. Mercifully, Dr. Ward does not pummel his readers or sneer at those who take another position. Patiently, chapter by chapter, example by example, he makes his case, all of his work geared toward fostering more and better Bible reading. Highly recommended. Those are the words of D.A. Carson about our guest's book entitled Authorized. As we continue our conversation with Dr. Ward, we're going to hear yet another false friend example and talk about what the KJV translators themselves would have thought about KJV onlyism and more. I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Proverbs 22:28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Now, what I teach people in my videos is to go through a a process. And that process starts with noticing a possible false friend. And there are two major ways to do that. One is what I call contextual conflict, like what we just saw. Although you have to be a pretty good reader, I think, to even notice that the consequence meaning of so that doesn't fit very well. Sure. Um, The other way is much easier and much more likely to be successful, and that is checking other translations. So if I check other translations, I'm going to see that all of them, the ones I have, and my, my, my daily drivers, the ESV, New American Standard, NIV, and CSB, instead Mm. of remove not the ancient landmark, they have don't move an ancient boundary stone. So, you know, this is pretty simple, but there's a difference between moving and removing. If if I'm going to remove my couch, that means I'm putting it on the curb and it's going out to the dump. If I'm moving my couch, that means I'm putting it from, taking it from one place in the house to another. And, you know, as every wife can tell you, there's a big difference between moving the couch and removing the couch. So (laughs) which is it? Remove not the ancient landmark or move the ancient landmark? Move not the ancient landmark. And in fact, this is a rallying cry for our King James only brothers that amounts to hold on to tradition. They they talk about the old paths. You know, don't remove the King James because your fathers have said it. Mm. Um, And in Proverbs 22, there's actually no other context to let you know, well, what is he talking about? Yeah. But elsewhere in Proverbs, there's actually very similar wording. Proverbs 23, so just a few verses uh, later. Do not move, and, or let me read it in the King James. Remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless, for their redeemer is strong. He will plead their cause against you. Hmm. There's a little more context there. It's telling yeah. us what moving or removing, we still have yet to find out, the ancient landmark means. It means here's this boundary stone between your property and the property of the poor farmer next to you. If you move that thing, you could eat up some of his property and therefore enter into the fields of the fatherless and be stealing from them, stealing land and the bread that it creates. And Mm -hmm. that's a big deal. Their redeemer is strong. He will plead their cause against you. So what could it mean back in Proverbs 22 remove or move not the ancient landmark. Removing a landmark is either an act of uh, stealing or it is an act of a prank. And mm-hmm. I, that doesn't make sense. Um, yeah. the, the prank aspect, removing the ancient right. landmark, but moving it makes a lot of sense. So you look sure. at the Hebrew. It's the, it starts with the do not al and then taseg. And I'm looking at, it's a hephil, which is often causative, displace a boundary mark. So they're Mm. going for the move in halot, the move sense. And then if I look at the Oxford English Dictionary, it reveals that back in the Elizabethan era, remove and move were interchangeable. You know, re is kind of like a, um, 
an intensifier. And there mm. were people who said, I'm going to remove nearer the court. In other words, I'm moving my house, my goods, nearer the court. It's not remove. So the, mm. one of the very rallying cries used by my King James Only brothers to hold on to this tradition, they're actually misunderstanding it. Yeah, that's super helpful. And yeah, I'm, I'm just so thankful that you're doing what you're doing with this book, with your YouTube channel. This is super, super good, not only for that community, but just for everyone to think more critically and more more thoroughly about Scripture in general, you know? Yeah, I actually sort of had a question for you, Andrew, because you've got your eyes, you know, as a Bible translator, more on the global church and its yeah. needs. And I came to think, I read the Bible translator every once in a great while when somebody sends me an article. I wish I read it more often. I'm just not really in that community, although I'm fascinated by it and I love mm-hmm. your podcast. Surely, and I know this in part from your podcast, this is not a unique phenomenon. This is going to happen to every single Bible translation that is ever put out. Eventually, right. even Icelandic is going to change enough. And I don't, you know, I don't know mm-hmm. precisely where they're at right now, but I've heard, you know, you can Iceland Icelanders can read very old Icelandic sagas. Um, every language changes over time. It appears to be that God made it that way. It's not the fall; it's the way God made it. Sure. So um, what do Bible translators do to, you know, build in some kind of protection against Louis Sagand onlyism or <laughs> Chinese Union version onlyism? It, does this get talked about? Yeah. I don't think anybody anticipated that very much back in the day when they established those translations that have now become like the only translation. So, you know, I was working in Equatorial Guinea on revising a translation and updating a translation that was done in 1860s. Uh, this was of the Benga language, and but it was a, min- a minority language. And because of that, the people were more, definitely more flexible about this whole thing. And because that translation had never become totally ingrained or encrusted, I think a lot of people were more open to it. But yeah, when you get to these majority translations, I don't know of anybody in Bible translation that is taking active steps towards getting people to avoid, you know, becoming this is the only translation that we can ever use. Yeah, you know, you go back into history, and I see two things in history that both confirm my read of what King James Onlyism is and scare me to death. <laughs> And that tell me this is only going to keep happening and happening. And I just pray to the Lord, Lord, please don't let this happen again. The two stories are the famous story uh, of the Septuagint translators who mm-hmm. were all sent, you know, supposedly the 70 or 72 to separate rooms where they all translated the entire Hebrew Bible into Greek. <laughs> yeah. And when they came out, they all had identical translations. That is nothing other than Ruckmanism. Peter Ruckman is the guy who is most responsible for promoting the idea that the King James is itself inspired, that it actually corrects the Greek, that, you know, we have all these manuscripts of the Greek New Testament that have all these variants. Well, God, through the King James, not only made all the correct textual critical choices, but resolved ambiguities where the Greek is ambiguous, Mm. you know, Matthew 6, whatever it is, uh, is it uh, when Jesus says, um, how many of you, by thinking, can add a either cubit to his stature or like a measure to his span of life? It's ambiguous. Uh-huh. It could be either one. Uh-huh. Um, well, the King James translators got revelation from God, whether they knew it or not, and they picked the right one. Mm-hmm. That's Ruckmanism. Well, that's the same thing you see in the Septuagint. People don't want to have to trust Bible translators. They don't want anybody touching the cookies after they come out of the oven before they eat them. That's true. But I I keep telling people, this is the way God made it. It's okay. Yeah, keep your thinking cap on. The Jehovah's Witnesses actually did alter the meaning of John 1.1. But aside from that, we're talking about evangelical Christians here when it comes to English Bibles. You know, you really ought to be able, in general, to trust them and not be so suspicious. Yeah. The other, but that shows that that impulse goes back a long, long way oh, yeah. um, to have a perfect Bible translation. And the, the other story is, and maybe you remember the, the details better than I do, but pretty sure it was um, letters back and forth between Jerome and Augustine. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Augustine writing to Jerome. It might have been the opposite. 
uh, I've been meaning to track this down recently, but there was a, uh, you know, I think Jerome had retranslated Jonah, maybe it was, and he chose a different word for gourd than mm-hmm. their previous, you know, old Itala translation had at this church. And they like had a riot because he yeah. changed the word for gourd. <laughs> And whenever I hear that, of course, I think of the King James Only Movement. I do also think to my, about some of my other conservative evangelical brothers who, in my mind, have the same level of freak out, even over changes within the ESV, like a, a, a doctorate in history, a guy that I knew, middle-aged guy, super sharp, intelligent, out, you know, incredible guy. Nonetheless, he was really upset about the ESV coming out in different editions because what if they change one of my memory verses? And I'm thinking, we've got to be better than this. And Lord, <laughs> you know, why does this have to be so hard for people? To me, it's like, if there's a difference between translations, like, oh, cool, let me look into it. Let's talk about this. But I, I get it that people find it, and they have for centuries found it to be upsetting. So I, you, people like you and me who know utterly what's going on, we have all the tools to check it out. You know, we're not unsettled by this. I've had to come to recognize I need to be really patient with people because they simply do not know. If they have two translations that differ, they literally have no idea what to do next. Right. Their only thought is one of them must be right and one of them must be wrong. Mm-hmm. And, so we, we have a teaching role, apparently, and that's what I'm trying to do on my YouTube channel. And I know you're doing the same thing in various media from a different angle there, and for actually multiple different angles, with Olive with Beth and with your translation podcast, trying to calm everybody down, say it's okay. But one thing I'd like to see the Bible translation community do, and, and maybe if, they're, if people in that community are listening to this, and I have friends in that community, is to think ahead. You know, build yeah. institutions, self-perpetuating ones, Lord willing, you know, nothing lasts forever, it's up to God, but that actually think of the need of the entire church in a given region as much as you possibly can, and pick a level of revision frequency and and put it in the intro, maybe, to make sure people see it, to expect it. Right. That will be often enough to keep it accessible to the plowboy because vernacular translation is a value we have to keep fighting for. It's not a hill that you win and then you're there forever. You know, it exactly. recedes. And, and then, you know, in the English-speaking world, could somebody with power, could Billy Graham come down from heaven <laughs> and dip his finger in water and cool the tongues of all the people around here <laughs> at publishing houses who keep putting out new Bibles, which are great. They're all great, and I'm glad to have them, but... They are, they're bewildering to lay people. Right. We've got to stop somewhere and try to think of the needs of everybody. How can we steward the, the translations we have, the good ones we have, with, without just proliferating more, mm-hmm. without making it appear like we're tampering with the Bible, to, you know, make our own translation, whether for theological or fin- financial reasons. I don't think that's what's happening. I really don't. But I can totally see how it looks like that. How can we steward the trust of lay people in our nation, or or, uh, not nation, but English-speaking world, and in the other language slash, well, ethnoi of the world? Yeah, yeah. That's a really good word. And I I agree. There's definitely more that can be done that we should be doing in the Bible translation community to prepare people to not fall into that trap. And, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is, is first of all, I would hope that these communities that we're working with, by and large, would not be as tempted to fall into this trap because they're not monolingual, usually. Usually they're, they're multilingual. And I, I feel like a lot of these high vitriolic tensions between people in the U.S. about translations— boils down to being monolingual, and they actually have no idea what it is like to think in another language, to speak another language. And so why would they ever think about translation nuances? So that's, that's one thing that I would hope to counteract this, uh, this tendency. The other thing would be that what we're doing with Aleph with Beth, the more we teach people, the lay people, yes. the biblical languages, and we get that into their blood early on— yep the more they're just going to grow up being very comfortable checking these things out and comparing things and being way more flexible, I would hope, in their response to new revisions. Yeah. Yeah. Literally today, I was on the phone uh, for the second time in two days at length with a pastor in middle age who was previously a very significant leader in the King James only world, and I can't give more details, Mm -hmm. Uh, but he said that what really 
destroyed his King James onlyism, and he still kind of feels like the Texas Receptus is better. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, fine, that's totally fine. I don't think the differences are significant. But what really killed the the King James onlyism part of it for him was taking Hebrew. As mm. a, I don't know, 40-something-year-old guy, he finally got the opportunity to just do one year. And he awesome. said, I had been told that dynamic translations were of the devil, and only word-for-word word translations were acceptable. Yeah. And he said, when I learned Hebrew, I saw, that is impossible. <laughs> the elliptical way in which Hebrew often expresses itself, especially in poetry, y- you have to interpret you mm-hmm. can't just translate word for word or it'll be meaningless. Yeah. And I was just saying, yes, yes, that's yeah. so true. And, and actually, the fact that God chose to do it this way um, means to me that learning the original languages, along with uh, an appreciation for using multiple translations, brings you closer to the truth than if you only had one, one aspect of that. You know, mm-hmm. when I read something difficult in Proverbs, I know the Hebrew is difficult. It's, you know, it's, it's beyond my level of Hebrew. I like it that I can go check the opinions of godly, careful, knowledgeable people, and even some ungodly ones like Robert Alter. You know, he's not a, he's not a believer in Christ. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying he's a ranked sinner. I'm just saying he's not yeah. a believer in Christ. He's got insight. Man, does he have insight. I bought his set, and I pull out those footnotes. Um, I love that. And the need for education, Piper says this in his book, Think. I know you're a Piper fan. Yep. Uh, I am too. It's an um, excellent book, the, by the way. Everyone needs to sure read it. Sure is. <laughs> yes. And it's short. Um, the, the need for education that's generated by this situation that God has given us, where he inspired the Bible in three different languages, which almost nobody would know as a native speaker, you know, all of them. Um, and right. today, nobody would. You know, it demands the construction of institutions of some kind of learning from Aleph with Beth to seminaries to what have you. I'm not saying they're all inspired by God. I'm saying Mm -hmm. we have to do something in order to hold on to God's words that he's inspired for us. Amen. Yeah, I, I think one thing that comes to mind as well as we're talking about this, when we train people in translation principles on the field who are going to be mother tongue translators... This is a huge antidote to that kind of mentality of, of becoming encrusted in only one version. Uh, at least you know, the way I teach it, the resources that I use to teach it, there's no way any of my students can come out thinking it's okay to just latch onto one <laughs> translation forever. Yeah. And the, the only thing that I would say is we need to encourage more of these people to be passing on that same kind of training in some some way, maybe not the same detail, but those same kind of, you could, you could have a weekend workshop or something at the church and really get your community understanding, okay, this is what's going on and this is where we don't want to fall prey to what others have, have done in the past. So yeah, that's a good word. I, I think next time I teach translation principles, I want to encourage the people learning to pass that on, to pay it forward to as much of their community as possible. Now, I have another question for you, Andrew. Oh boy! Okay, go um, for it. So, as I, I'm not in this to sell books. I'm in it to get the truth out there, just like you're just talking about. And here's something I'm running up against. Mm-hmm. I have enjoyed using multiple translations ever since I was 18 years old, and I bought a comparative study Bible from Crossway Christian Supply on South Pleasantburg Drive in Greenville, South Carolina. And it was 50 bucks, which in today's dollars is like coming up on 100. And I don't know where I got that money, but that was really wow. valuable to me if I was going to plunk down that money. And it had the King James, the Amplified Bible, the New American Standard, and of course the 1984 NIV. So 95 NASB mm-hmm. and 84 NIV. Mm-hmm. And I wore that thing out. I still got it. I got tons of notes in it. I learned inductively that King yeah. James onlyism is wrong because over and over and over again, checking multiple translations just helped me understand. And I'm not saying mm-hmm. I needed the NIV to understand the King James alone. It's like it was in the interplay of all of them yeah. that I, you know, got to understand better. So, you know, you can pry my multiple Bible translations out of my cold, dead hand. Um, <laughs> I love these things. They're, they're tools for understanding God's Word. But... Right at that same time, I was starting to learn Greek and gain the skills necessary to go check out what's happening when two translations differ in a way that I can't explain, you know, merely as shades of English nuance. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And um, I now forget, honestly, what it's like to be somebody who doesn't have access to the Hebrew and Greek. So I've had this desire for Mm -hmm. years, and I'm coming up to my question for you. I had a desire for years to work on a project, probably a book, that teaches lay people who, in God's providence, haven't been given the opportunity to study Hebrew or Greek, how to use multiple Bible translations with profit. The yeah. few times when I have pressed godly, knowledgeable, wonderful Bible students at the lay level, please tell me, what have you discovered when you check multiple Bible translations? I've been disappointed every time. Nine times out of ten, they have nothing to tell me. Hmm. And that one other time out of ten, what they tell me just isn't right. It's not true. Okay. The insight they came to, they they misunderstood. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I'm a little bit worried, like, is this possible? I have to think that it is, and I've got some strategies for it. But do you think it's possible to teach people who haven't, in God's providence, had the opportunity to study Hebrew or Greek, um, to use multiple Bible translations profitably? Or would you just say, no, they just need to go to Olive with Beth, and then they'll be able to (laughs) compare translations? Well, as we've said on our Twitter and Facebook feeds probably multiple times, like, Having access to the biblical languages does not preclude coming up with heretical doctrines or it does not guarantee it's not a silver bullet for anything really at the end of the day. It's just the tool that you need to get there. And so I've run into so many different kinds of people in teaching. You know, one of the big struggles for me in Central Africa was that the school system doesn't really train people to think critically. To actually yeah. digest an idea and then be able to put it in their own words was a foreign idea to most people. Some of the brightest that I worked with, um, unfortunately. But because the school system basically drove into people's heads, into this rut that it was just all about rote memorization, spouting yeah. things out that people wrote on the board, even if they didn't understand them. I think there are probably a lot of people like that in the world, and the body of Christ is just going to have to really be patient with with everyone as they teach and learn new strategies. But I don't have a great answer for you. All I can say is I understand where you're coming from, and I don't think I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's hard. Yeah. I just think it's hard. Well, God was patient with both of us, right? And I look back at some of my Bible reading practices, and I cringe, and I just know that I kept putting the time in, and slowly, 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 with a lot of help from teachers, I improved in my Bible study. So I'm absolutely willing to be patient with the sheep. I just don't want to be stupid and set out a goal for them or for my teaching of them that's just unrealistic or unnecessary. But Mm. it's partly your fault, Andrew, because you have this (laughs) Don Quixote idea that you're going to teach everybody in the church Hebrew and Greek, and I just love it. I love it. And you've inspired me. So if I fail, I will blame you, but in in love, you know, I'll still be grateful. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, I think it's just one of those, you've got to have a God-sized goal and, you know, go for it with all you've got and... We'll see what we'll see what the Lord does, but th- that's the best you that's can good. do, you know, is is just have a really God sized goal. Because if you succeed, then you can say the only way I can explain that this succeed is because of God and not because of me. <laughs> so right, that's a it's a good place to be. Yeah, my book actually, and the teaching I've done on it at a couple of seminaries and schools, you know, books often open up those opportunities. I've been really surprised how many. Uh, you know, pastors and Mm. serious Bible students who are taking time out of their lives to go to Bible college, paying money for it, giving their evenings. Um, How many of them are one translation onlyists, but Mm. they're not King James onlyists. They just use whatever their pastor uses. And like, that's okay too. I'm not saying there's something doctrinally wrong with that, but I've gotten notes from especially a number of pastors at a seminary that I taught this kind of material at and they said, you really helped me see the value in multiple translations. And I sort of thought pastors were already on board with that, and they understood that. Well, they mm. don't. Not, well, not all of them do. And yeah. um, that's been really gratifying. So what I, what I think I find is that I'm not – I don't know how many lay people I'm helping. I, I must be helping some. I pray that I am. But I, pastors really do seem to get help. 
from this kind of work. And so it's trickle-down economics, I guess, trickle-down theology. Hopefully they can, you know, relay this value to their people. And at the very least, they can do what people like me and my friend Annie DeSelli have encouraged them to do, and that is not talk about English Bible translations like everyone you disagree with is, you know, done by total idiots. Uh, right. If you, if you end up in a sermon um, having to disagree with the main translation in people's laps, be really careful about that. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't do that hardly ever. And if you have to disagree with some other major modern evangelical translation, you think some of them are holding in their laps, you know, steward the trust of those people in their Bible translations. Speak respectfully. Uh, speak humbly, because you may totally be missing why there's a difference there. Um, mm. at the, if, if more pastors would do that, I think that could be a big, big help. And I I've, think so. Um, I've, I've seen that happen. Uh, p- pastors who are just speaking passionately, and they can't understand why the NIV would do such and such. You know, what, what do p- lay people hear in that? They, they hear, don't ever touch that NIV. It's not going to help you. It's going to lead you astray. It's unaccountably strange and odd and doing wrong things. You know, probably something bad, you know, motivating those guys, maybe yeah. money. They fill in those blanks with some pretty negative things, and they end up setting aside what could be the very best tool for that particular person at that time in their lives to get through the Old Testament or just whatever Mm -hmm. Bible reading task they have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this all comes back to our kids, and that's the thing I want want to encourage more people to think about. And, you know, Jesus is very serious about not putting stumbling blocks in front of children. You know, as a Sunday school teacher, when I was with 9 and 10 year olds, I, I was constantly running up against, okay, this tension that we, we, we have all of our little pet preferences about our Bible translations, but are they actually helping our kids at the end of the day? And is yes. that, it, and is that not important to Jesus's heart, you know? So it's a, it's a really serious thing, I, I think, that a lot of people, it, it's not just about saying, oh, kids, buck up and be smart. It's, I don't think Jesus would have encouraged that mentality. Um, sure, foster your kids and, and growth intellectually, but unreasonable obstacles sometimes right. are, can be very discouraging to, to children. Well, one of the blunter lines in my whole book, and it's not a long book, and I really work and pray hard to be gracious, and my wife helped me on that. But I ultimately came to say that it is a violation of Paul's principle in 1 Corinthians 14 to give a King James to a child. Mm -hmm. And I got some really nice, courteous pushback from a pastor who is unbelievably gracious and sent me a $50 Amazon gift card because he appreciated my book so much. But he said, I can't give it to my congregation because you said that. Because Mm -hmm. he says, it seems like you're saying that I'm sinning. And I had to really think about this. Do I need to take this out in the second edition? I do want to say carefully, I do not believe it is always and everywhere a sin for people to use the King James or for pastors to use the King James. I think what I meant was, and I think this is a charitable interpretation of what I said in the book, that once you realize, once somebody with you know linguistic nerdiness like myself has pointed out to you the dead words and false friends and the tension they stand uh, in mm-hmm. with 1 Corinthians 14, then yeah, it's a violation to hand this to kids. And Mm -hmm. I I just can't back off of that. Um, And so I've thought about this carefully because I have kids. I have three kids, 11, 9, and 6, and they're all readers now. My littlest Mm -hmm. one is, you know, still a beginning reader, but they all have Kindles and they all love their Kindles and they read, 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 read all the time. And I know my first two, especially because I know their reading habits, they are good readers, Mm -hmm. Um, They're still working on spelling, but their reading is fantastic, and they score really well on it. I know the kind of home that they are most likely to grow up in, mine. I know the kind of training that they're most likely to get, which would be almost identical to the one that I got. I am more willing to teach them some things, traditional things that they won't fully understand right now, knowing that I'm stocking their heads for later. Uh, I'm I'm willing to do that, like with, you know, using the ESV even, for example, places where it is so literal that, you know, maybe I could use something more understandable. I think they will get it. But for, for me, it was in evangelism year after year to people who are not going to get those same opportunities for education, where it just came to hurt my heart like a dagger to think I'm teaching them words. They just won't understand. Hmm. We were using the New American Standard Bible in this uh, ministry. Hmm. 
And we were pouring our hearts out for these kids and teenagers and some few adults who would come to our various weekly ministries years and years. And my, my church back in South Carolina is still doing this, so it's a wonderful place. Yeah. Um, and we taught them all Proverbs 3, 21b to 23. Keep sound wisdom and discretion so they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. Then you will walk in your way securely and your foot will not stumble. And I understand every word of that. And I, I taught that to hundreds, literally hundreds of teen boys. And I asked every single one of them, what does this mean? And I asked them specific questions, Socratic questions, leading them along. What does this mean? Mm. I, I'm not exaggerating to say nobody fully understood it. Wow. And I, and I love that church. It's a wonderful church, not a King James only church. I'm not criticizing them. I'm so grateful for them. I just seem to have a special burden to ask that question, like the small child in the crowd, like, you know, that emperor up there, actually those clothes that he's quote unquote <laughs> wearing, um, they're not clothes. Yeah. That's what I feel like. And it is so easy to let tradition, even a very recent tradition, like we had only begun using the numerican standard a couple of years prior to that, to to just kind of blind you to what we're doing here. And I'm not erasing all the good that that ministry did. I'm saying those times, and we taught those verses where they couldn't fully understand them. Why did we bother? Mm -hmm. Going back to Spurgeon's church, if we may, if we were to look into those tracts or booklets against other vernacular translations, what kind of stuff that we haven't talked about yet might we find in there? What kind of main objections would they have to people reading translations besides the key, the KJV? And how would you typically respond to some of those? That's like 10 cans of worms. I'll try to, I'll pick the main ones. I mean, they're <laughs> at, at um, the Metropolitan Tabernacle, you know, I would count them as at the tippy top among the very best of the proponents of the King James only viewpoint. Okay. And so they are going to have a, a pretty rigorous distinction between text and translation. And right. they're going to focus most of their energy on text. But let me give you an example of where this kind of goes awry. The Trinitarian Bible Society puts out you know, various publications, and the New King James and the Modern English Version are both based on the same text as the King James. So I have pushed that with my King James Only Brothers. I, if they're saying the text is the issue, you know, we're really for the Texas Receptus, theoretically we could accept a different translation of it. I say, mm -hmm. well, why not consider the New King James, the modern English version? And I, and I take their treatment of those options as a barometer for how King James only they are. And they all come out King James only, truly King James only, because nothing else will be acceptable. And I looked mm -hmm. very hard at the best critiques of the New King James. You know, it's been out 40 years now. They've had an opportunity, many opportunities in the King James only world to undermine confidence in it, frankly. Mm. And I read a 38,000 word piece with footnotes from a, a Bible scholar at Trinitarian Bible Society um, in two parts. And in the first 19,000 words, all he talked about was text even though okay. the New King James uses the same text. So they still do get those issues confused. You'll, you'll find that frequently. Text and translation get conflated. But in the second half, he talked about multiple translation errors of major doctrinal import. And I'm thinking, okay, okay, you know, this can happen. Let me look at the examples. And I looked one by one. I wrote a lengthy piece in response. This is how I process mm -hmm. things is to, to write them out. And over and over, I was simply underwhelmed by his critiques. A couple times, he got tripped up by false friends in the King James Version, which I found to be ironic. Oh, wow. Um, he also, what it really came down to was taking a possible interpretation, let's say a possible misinterpretation of a choice in the New King James Version and spinning it out into a narrative in which the New King James translators were actually trying to undermine sound doctrine. So hmm. hell becomes Hades oh. in the New King James, and this is a longer discussion, but basically he says that, you know, instead of talking about the biblical hell, they're talking about, you know, the Greek underworld. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's going to mislead people. And I'm thinking, buddy, you know, how many people are going to be misled by that today versus, you know, Hades was actually the word chosen by the apostles. You know, who's more likely to be misled and mis to misunderstand? People back in that day that actually believed that Hades existed or people today who only know about it from that movie Hercules? So it, and yeah. and I, I had to come to this. I, I could not avoid the conclusion that this gentleman, my brother in Christ, I keep saying because I believe it's true, he was being malicious 
toward his brothers who produced the New King James Version. He, mm. he was twisting as negatively as he could mm -hmm. any little thing and trying to fit it into a narrative in which all the modern translations are trying to soften or undermine sound doctrine. Right. And, and this is the best. This is the best guy out there as far as skill goes. Mm -hmm. And still I'm seeing simple lack of Christian charity toward his brothers. You're, you're going to be lost in a bunch of textual details, often conflated with translation details in mm -hmm. these little booklets that they put out. Um, what you're going to get with the Trinitarian Bible Society, though, is they, they won't be nasty like Peter Ruckman is. They, they have a British sense of decorum, and they okay. do recognize that we are their brothers in Christ. But their grave, grave, grave concerns about all the mistranslations in the New King James, you know, make it so that they absolutely cannot recommend it. Mm -hmm. And I, I just find myself being unpersuaded. Th those are maybe the, the leading okay. things that I think you would see in those booklets. Now, now, let me ask further about the text. So, the argument I always hear is only about the Textus Receptus, which is only New Testament. So, I have never heard anyone challenge the Masoretic text because they both, you know, all translations share that in common for the Hebrew. Is that right? Is that correct? So, they would be fine. They have no, no qualms with other translations in the Old Testament, technically, as, as far as, as the text goes, anyway. Right. He okay. Hebrew knowledge is at an epidemic low in the King James only world. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I just can't, I, I can sort of think of one guy who's sort of on the edge of that world who knows Hebrew. There must be more, um, but you won't hear much about Hebrew in part because of what you've said, but mm -hmm. what you will still hear if they do get around to mentioning it, and it does come up, is that the contemporary translations don't use the same Masoretic Hebrew text. You know, there are different editions, and you're supposed to use the Ben Chaim, and they often just kind of conflate Old Testament oh. and New Testament textual criticism and act as if both texts in modern translations are utterly corrupted. But if you look, it's it's almost always the New Testament that they're talking about. And if they bring up the Old Testament, it's rarely actually a textual difference, which they wouldn't even know usually how to find. It's usually a translational difference. And sometimes they think it's a textual difference and it's actually a translation difference. They okay. never, ever talk about the Kathif Kare readings in the mm -hmm. Hebrew Old Testament. Mm -hmm. um, they do claim commonly that the Hebrew Masoretic text and the Greek Textus Receptus are perfectly preserved. Every jot and tittle, they take Matthew 5, 8, to refer to perfect textual preservation, uh, but they do get really fuzzy when you ask about the particulars. Um, okay. But yeah, you're, you're right to observe that they almost always talk about the New Testament and not the Old Testament. Okay. So they would reject any use of Septuagint in Old Testament translation? Yeah, that that's fuzzy too. I mean, that's, that's advanced. That's at least, you know, seminary mm -hmm. level, and um, I just don't hear many of them talking about it. This is something I actually don't know. The The original KJV translators, did they have recourse to anything besides the Masoretic text, just one version of the Masoretic text? Well, yes and no. And, you know, you're, you're pinning me on one really specific question I wish I knew the answer to. <laughs> yeah. Did they actually use any Septuagint readings? I really should know that. People should go to kjbhistory.com. My friend Timothy Berg is, huh. in my mind, the world top expert on the King James Bible okay. in this debate. He's a gracious guy and patient, and he he's working on the credentials that will match his level that he's already reached in knowledge, but he's the one that I would go to for that question. Okay. I do know from their preface, they're absolutely well aware of the Septuagint, and they speak yeah. very intelligently about it. Uh, they note, for example, that the apostles quoted the Septuagint, even though it wasn't in all places, even where they quoted it, a great right. translation of the Hebrew. And they say that they did that because if they made their own translation, if the apostles made their own translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, they would have been, you know, patient of the charge that you are just making this up, you know, you're changing the Bible in order to suit your doctrine. And so they quoted the standard form of the text used by Jews in that day. The... Um, the, the Bible, the King James is called, it says on the frontispiece, you know, former translations diligently compared and revised, and they actually did check multiple other languages uh, and mm -hmm. their translations of the day. So, right. I mean, these are top biblical scholars. They did sure. everything that we would do, you know, but, but in, you know, using the tools of that era. Right. 
Yeah, because I personally would be very surprised if they never took any Septuagint readings seriously. I agree. In their, in I agree. Translation. Okay. Well, we're now down to the last question. What would you say Scripture itself has to say about this whole debate? How would you, how would you argue or use Scripture to help guide this conversation? And what would the KJV translators themselves think about this whole debate? The second one is easier, and I'll start with that one. I'm absolutely confident that the King James translators are not were not King James only. They have this beautiful—I mean, the preface is unbelievably uh, rich and beautiful aesthetically— and they, I think I have this memorized, but I can pull it up here too on my computer. I have it in like the text snippets because I have to use it so frequently in my discussions with King James only folks. Nice. They say, there's no cause therefore why the word translated should be denied to be the word or forbidden to be current. That is, you know, put out in circulation, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes may be noted in the setting forth of it. In other words, no translation is going to be perfect. And that doesn't, we shouldn't have to wait until we can produce a perfect translation to make it available to people. And they asked this somewhat difficult to understand rhetorical question that I'll explain. For whatever was perfect under the sun, where apostles or apostolic men, that is, men endued with an extraordinary measure of God's spirit and privileged with the privilege of infallibility, had not their hand. In other words, without inspiration, you don't get perfect translations. So the King James translators were not King James only, and I stand on their side against their supposed defenders. They pushed for the value of vernacular translation, opening up the cover of the well, you know, uh, opening up the window to let in the light. These are the beautiful illustrations that they use. Hmm. The the two major places that I would go uh, to answer that question, aside from 1 Corinthians 14, which has been highly disputed, and I must say, not entirely persuasive with my King James only audience, because they always say to me that Paul is talking about two totally different languages. Mm -hmm. And I find it difficult to explain to people that languages, you know, can exist on a Venn diagram where you've got Elizabethan English and contemporary English, like two overlapping circles that are slowly pulling apart. And yeah. so they can usefully be regarded as separate languages, even though obviously I acknowledge that they're not you know, mm -hmm. as we use that term usually, they're, they're not different languages. Sure. But a language is a group of people who agree to understand one another, and um, all the people who spoke that English are dead. So we don't have that agreement, and we are not using English the same way they did. So so I'll, I go on to Matthew 28, you know, teach everybody to observe everything that I've commanded you. And historically, you know, Christians throughout the ages have seen that as a reason to do Bible translation, to get God's mm -hmm. Word into every language of the earth. I mean, you've got Revelation that um, also talks about people from every tongue praising the Lamb, and how's that going to happen unless they have God's words in their language? So that that's a push that I make in my book, and then I also make the argument that I would like to deepen. I would like to understand this better, but I checked it with my, some, some knowledgeable friends, and I believe I can make this argument also from my personal knowledge, especially with Greek. The Greek of the New Testament is called koine for a reason, and we all know that if there's going to be a lingua franca, if there's going to be a common language, it's not going to be able to observe all of the niceties that the most elite speakers of the language, the ones who define the academic standard, you know, are able to maintain. So the lie-lay distinction in English and the which-that distinction, you know, I got the lie-lay down, but which-that, I never can remember even myself, even though I'm <laughs> yeah. a writer and an editor. Sure. Um, when I read Nigel Turner's uh, syntax volume, and boy did I slave over that thing, and boy was it valuable, I saw over and over and over again him saying, this grammatical feature used to be, in the classical period, a fine distinction that was observed. And of course, he's talking about some of the most legendary writers of the Western tradition. But he said, by the Koine period, it had eroded. This distinction was no longer operative. Koine is common. Vulgate, the Latin vulgate, comes from the word that means common. The language God chose for the New Testament was the language of the people. That doesn't mean, as anybody who's read the New Testament, that all of it's equally easy. You know, Revelation and First John are easier. Acts, Luke, and Hebrews are harder. But it's all, it was all contemporary, for sure. 
And, it, you know, if it was different in social register, as I think that it, it was, it stretches from lower to higher, it, it nonetheless still belongs in what I would call the vernacular, the language that you learn from birth. And I think that choice itself is not just a lesson, but actually a norm for us. I, I don't want to land on, I don't want to stand on that as much as I stand on Bible statements. I really don't. Mm -hmm. But in the absence of any other you know, guidance from the Lord explicitly, then teach everybody to observe what I've commanded you. And he inspires at least the New Testament in the language of the people. Um, and I, I think the Hebrew Bible as well, though, you know, you, you'll probably need to speak into that more than I would. I feel less certain about that. We have less Hebrew from outside the Old Testament to compare it to. Sure. Um, but when I checked with folks who knew better, they said, yeah, I, I think that's still a, a solid argument. So th those are my two major polls. We've got what the Bible says and how the Bible says it. Those are my ways of answering that question. Hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time and God bless you in your ministry and future videos and everything else you do. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I just have to say thank you to your listeners for listening and thank you to you for your work. I really do. I'm not just saying this because I'm on your show. I really love your podcast. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for joining us for this wonderful conversation. And once again, I really would encourage you to check out Dr. Mark Ward's other resources, his book, his YouTube channel. There's links in the description. This podcast, Working for the Word, is a podcast where we believe the Bible is a unified, God-breathed, God-centered, hope-giving book, sweeter than honey and pointing to Jesus. Jesus.